In a recent Vaughn Palmer piece, the headline states, BC forest companies expanding at a rapid rate, but not at home. The next line says $10 billion worth of money has gone elsewhere. Elsewhere. And the reason is the business climate in this province right now is dark, stormy, and uncertain. In late December of 2019, former Premier Glenn Clark whispered in my ear, don't people understand that if you make the business environment so challenging and unwelcoming, well, those with the money will just invest somewhere else. Since then, the flow of capital out of BC has accelerated, including Canfor, which recently invested $420 million to acquire Alberta-based Miller Western Forest products. The permit economy is the area of our economy that has been affected the most. Any company that requires government approval to do business, especially in the resource sector, has to think long and hard now about investing in BC. And even when they go to extraordinary lengths to ensure that every condition is met along with solid First Nations relationships and agreements, those companies then become prime targets for protests. Take Teal Jones, for example. It is a BC forestry success story. The largest family-owned private forestry company on the coast. The company is a perfect example of sustainability. Teal Jones Mills every tree it harvests into more than 18,000 different products from facilities in BC. The company has long-standing agreements with more than 100 First Nations. All this and this remarkable company has now decided that yes it will continue to invest in BC but it's also now investing outside of BC. I invited Conrad Brown, the Director of Indigenous Partnership and Strategic Relations at Teal Jones, to join me for a conversation that matters about the reasons why BC is becoming a less attractive investment location. Conrad, welcome. Thank you, Stuart. Glad to be here. Is there anything in my opening remarks there that makes you go, oh, no, maybe you're a little too hard on the province or you're, you're maybe pushing the edges here? I don't think you're pushing it hard enough, to be honest with you. Really? I think that the, uh, the province has now switched into the propaganda stage, and all the TV, radio ads that we're hearing are pushing that agenda that isn't welcomed by just about everybody in the province, um, so especially the business side of things. Well, yeah, and you know, I touched on the forestry industry, but the resource sector as well. Anything that you want to do that requires government permission now as a company becomes so onerous that you start to question whether or not there's going to be an appropriate return on investment. Is this worth doing? And are those the discussions that you're now starting to have? Oh, we've been having those for a long, long time. Um, for our company doing forestry, we have a minimum of 106 steps that we have to take before we can actually fire up a chainsaw to go after uh, harvesting of any kind of species within the province of British Columbia. Um, once we do start harvesting, there's a whole other layer of regulations that we must follow, work safe and things like that. Our number one priority is safety. So, um, so the onerous side of that, that permitting process, we've become accustomed to it, we've adapted to it. What really worries us now is the government has been moving through some legislation in a very fast manner with absolutely zero input from industry, uh, zero input from small towns where, the, where a lot of these industries operate from, uh, very little input from the Indigenous side. Uh, they came out again with a bit of propaganda the other day and said that they had 75% feedback from First Nations around, around their thing. Well, guess what? This morning it came out that only one agreed to the deferral process and that was with an asterisk. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's quite interesting to see how the province is washing this around. So for a company like Teal Jones, you've been here for a long time, going back to the mid-1940s, family-owned, committed to BC. You weren't sending out raw logs. You're doing all of that you know, value-added product work, and yet you find yourself now saying, this is our home, but we're starting to look elsewhere. As soon as the NDP was elected, um, Tom and Dick Jones knew that the potential for something like this was to happen. So about seven years ago is when they did their first investment. Um, and in the last couple of years, they've really been ramping up that investment into the south. Um, 
the latest announcement of a $110 million investment into Louisiana is just the latest of those investments, bringing 125 permanent full-time jobs, well-paying jobs, uh, with full benefits uh, down to a community that, to be honest with you, is not accustomed to that type of thing. The, the governor, the state representatives, all the business people were so welcoming to Tom and Dick Jones, um, somebody that actually wanted to come and do good business and to support their economy and to help build their economy. Um, it's night and day. I have heard from industry leaders here that they try to phone, you know, the provincial government, talk to ministers or the premier. They don't get a return phone call. But when they turn to invest in states in the United States, the governor answers their call within the hour. It, are you seeing that same kind of, like, strange dynamic, the relationship between your business and legislators here versus new territories that you're moving into and those legislators? Again, Stuart, it's night and day. It absolutely is. The welcoming uh, aspect is, is one piece, and your quote from uh, Glenn Clark is spot on. Mm -hmm. if, if your investment is welcome, and it's a true, uh, honest opening into a business uh, concept or a business down in the States, they're more than happy to speak with you. Um, we can't get a, a sit down with anybody, uh, upper, upper provincial government in, in a number of years. If anything, we're told- Years? Sure. You we've know. been told, you can get to a deputy minister, but then all of a sudden that's being filtered up, right? where something like a company like Teal Jones, a thousand employees, 500 in Surrey, uh, we have all kinds of different relationships. We've been in the province and working in the province uh, in a very positive way for, like you said, since 1946, when Jack Jones came back from the war and took his stipend from the <laughs> military and started his little mill. Uh -huh. um, so it, it gets quite frustrating when you can't even be a part of the process to have a voice at a table when that table is seems to be um, overrun by environmentalists, the five person panel that, that set up all these uh, old growth deferrals, four of which came from an environmental group. Um, could you imagine if the government did that with an, in four people from one, one person in the industry or one company from the industry, what kind of uproar that would have caused? Um, as, a, as an industry, we sat quietly while this was ho going on, hoping that we would be, end up having a voice at the table. We've never had that opportunity. Um, starting to hear more and more now from different companies uh, around process, around those those talks, those discussions, and, there, and the lack thereof. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest with you, I don't know where respect falls into it, but you are, uh, by doing these steps, you're undermining one of the most important industries in British Columbia. We built British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And by doing these decisions, um, the public really needs to stop, listen really hard about where the bill is going to be being paid in the next number of years. Uh, the tax base that's being lost, the revenues for the government that's being lost, um, the revenues for the hardworking people in the province are, that are going to be lost. They come out with some terminology about transition funding, about training, about all kinds of different things. I can guarantee you none of them have ever worked in any situation that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I've been involved with pulp mills shutting down. I've been involved with other industries being uh, greatly reduced. None of that funding ever comes to fruition, ever. Uh, or the people that are undertaking the training, the, the jobs that aren't there at the other end. So, right, so it's an empty promise. It is essentially an empty promise. So. You take a look at a company like Teal Jones, and if, if you look at, I won't say the pedigree of the company, I mean, you are invested in BC. This is a BC company. You do all this work here, you do everything that you're supposed to, and then you become targeted. What does that do to like you as a company psychologically? What does it do for the morale of the people who work with you? So <clears throat> it's, a, it's an interesting point that you raise around the morale because it has been extremely difficult for our everyday workers that are just wanting to make a, a honest solid living out in the forest uh, particular T um, sorry TFL 46 yeah um, that's there's a big union component to the workforce out there they just come off an eight-month strike they were already hurting and hungry uh, they just finally got fired back up again started going to work and all of a sudden these protesters showed up 
and now they're being forced not to go to work when they're legally allowed to go to work. Um, so the fact that the workforce has maintained their cool through this whole process is amazingly uh, important to recognize. Um, the fact that uh, our workers have continued to do safe, uh, honest, hard work in work every day, and of course our forestry, no matter what the environmentalist protesters or governments trying to tell you, our forestry practices lead the world. Mm -hmm. So when the government is out there knocking our current forest practices, it's really hard to take because we have some amazing forestry professionals. If you want to spin, you can spin just about anything. Um, and it's unfortunate that the government's chosen to do this. And in my opinion, they're taking a huge leap backwards with their proposed legislation that's going to be coming out. So it's going to go back to the Forest Act instead of the forest, um, the current regulations and legislation that we have. So in my opinion, we're taking steps backwards. And the other thing that the public should know and sort of ask is, if the government's going to get so much more involved in the process, where are the people to do that? Yeah. The government doesn't even have enough employees as it is to do it as it currently is. Never mind taking on more responsibility for long-term planning, for roads, for bridges. I can go on. Mm -hmm. So the public needs to start to wonder, well, where are all these magical people coming from, right? Because they're simply not in place right now. So you are facing these protests, but then you also look at the coverage and the way that you're portrayed as a company uh, is as though somehow you have a disregard for the environment and yet everything that you do would suggest that you care deeply about the health and well-being of these environments. When you start to see that kind of coverage, what kind of impact does that have on you? So, so there's a few <laughs> points that need to be made around that and um, some of them are difficult for the average person to understand but Teal Jones has been a company in British Columbia for so many years that has just pulled their boots on every morning put their hard hats on or just went to work. And that's all that they've ever wanted to do. Every decision Tom and Dick make is for the best of their employees. That's lip service to some, but it's honestly, they, I've been in so many meetings where that is the foremost thought in their process is how is this going to affect our employees? So the, at the very start of the whole protest, they wanted just to stay quiet. They wanted to be able to go and go to work. That's why they went to the courts to ask for the injunction um, because they had approached the protesters many, many times and, and tried to have ability to go in. Of course, that's not gonna happen. The injunction gets put in place. That's not gonna happen. Then the police get involved because they have to support the court's wishes. And then we were slowly allowed to do piecemeal work through the summertime. Um, so at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's really difficult from a public's perspective because they're getting the spin from the press, they're getting the spin, uh, a very well orchestrated spin from the environmentalists. They've spent a lot of money and the millions of dollars that they've done through fundraisers, uh, GoFundMe, Razors, never mind the money that flows in from the United States environmental movements. Um, so there's, there's that whole component that we're, that we're trying to work against uh, or work around. So yeah, it's, it's been very difficult to be in the middle of the limelight, but Teal, Tom and Dick Jones chose to stay quiet. They chose just to try to go to work, to support their employees uh, through this process, stay positive. Um, but in the last few months, it's just gotten to the point where we have to start speaking. Mm -hmm. and uh, start to tell a little bit more of our side of the story. And it's really tough. I get it. The public is looking at the company as a big bad company because that's the way it's portrayed. But you're exactly right. It's a family-run business. There's 30 family members that actually work in the business currently. Our mill site has 32 families that are multi-generational that continue to work in the mill. Um, so there's, there's lots of amazing stories that we could go ahead and tell. And we're starting to tell more and more of those stories. Um, but what's most important from our perspective is the public really needs to understand the outcome of a lot of these decisions by our current government and how negatively impact it's going to be on, on the people of the province. Any idea why you got targeted? Because it's my understanding, I've done a fair bit of research about your approach to sustainable, responsible forestry within the tree farm license. Any idea why you got targeted? 
Um, well, we know how we got targeted. Why is a different story. Um, there's a few different speculations that one might have. Uh, it's not lost on anybody that it happens to fall in Premier Horgan's riding. Uh, it's two hours to Victoria on a paved road, so it's very easily accessed. Uh, the young man from the United States who actually had never set foot in the place when he first raised it, he did all this through, uh, through Google Earth and some, some information gathering that he had. And the whole Ferry Creek protest was based on a lie. He said that we were going into... Old growth forest. To, it was protected, to, correct? To clear the old growth forest. Which well, is not true. Absolutely not true. Ferry no. Creek has been protected and will continue to be protected long before they showed up and long after they have. Mm -hmm. um, we were absolutely going after a very small, almost like a postage stamp size uh, area adjacent to, right on the edge of the, the Ferry Creek for some actually low value <laughs> balsam and fir. Um, and that got spun into something that was taken completely out of context. Um, the grandfather tree that they were made huge headlines about that we're going to go and target this thing. It had been protected for a long time. Uh, it will be protected even further by the patchy dot. They put that into their cultural cedar um, set aside. So unless people understand the amount of planning that goes in, the amount of professional forestry that has to happen before we actually go and do any of this type of work, we, d we don't get the option of having a sexy, around the fire, playing a guitar uh, moment to be captured by the, by the press to be put out to the general public. We mm -hmm. don't have that. What we have is young men, women that are pulling on their bootstraps every single day and going to work in every kind of weather. So this has an impact on more than just your company. Of course, it has an uh, impact on First Nation community as well. Uh, 100%. So we, we uh, through all of our engagement within the communities, the Pachidat and the Dididat, whose mm -hmm. traditional territory we're on, we would never, ever think of harvesting without their permission. Uh, so through the consultation process, everything we had done, planning, process, uh, some some business arrangements that we made with the with the indigenous groups uh, was all done well ahead of time. They were, they were very well aware of what was going on and how we were going to go about doing it. The TFL 46 was purchased uh, just about the same time as we finished building our large second growth mill in Surrey. Mm -hmm. So the type of uh, profile that we were looking for was a smaller second growth log and that's what the vast majority of TFL 46 is. We have to target some of the old growth, the very small percentage of old growth that we are currently allowed to go and harvest. There's been hundreds, tens of thousands of hectares set aside into parks and that was after we purchased TFL 46. The government came in and took chunks out of our operating areas and put them into protected areas and parks. We can work around that, but mm -hmm. they still allowed us to have a small percentage of old growth, which we require for its many different characteristics. For uh, some of the products, 18,000 products that you produce. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And also for the health of the forest. Right. right. Trees die. Yeah. And whether they die at 1,000 years old or die at 100 years old, these trees need to be harvested. They do. Um, and they give us different products. So, and then the, the one thing that the public also has to understand is by going after those high, a uh, little bit higher end products or trees to create those products. It also allows us to go after some of the less desirable so we can take a full profile of the forest when we go into harvest. If all mm -hmm. of a sudden we're not able to do that, it becomes uneconomical and you're going to end up with patchwork type of forestry. Yes. And that's still to be determined in the years to come as the legislation changes within the province. Well, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of what ifs that are happening right now. And so that all starts to come back to you then making uh, future growth and investment decisions. 100%. If so we, BC would have been number one for the majority of the history of the company. Where does this jurisdiction or province now land in your, you know, I guess intentions towards the future? So Tom and Dick have, have uh, promised since 2019 to invest up to $60 million in their Surrey site. And there's a lot of that investment has been put into the mill. Uh, we're currently doing some, some upgrading, some modernization of the mill. Um, that money that is being reinvested was created 
through our work in British Columbia. Yeah. And we're reinvesting back into that. It needs to be clearly understood that all of the acquisitions and things we're doing in the United States are being done bankrolled down in the United States. We're not taking So you're Canadian, not taking money out of BC? Okay. No, absolutely not. Uh, the other important piece to understand is that it's actually the reverse. When we were at the toughest time in our industry a number of years ago, we were able to float through that from bringing some of that American money back into Canada to support us. So um, there's not very many people in the province that would tell that kind of story, but, no. it, but it's real. <laughs> yeah, It's a real story. So when the operations in the United States are operating, they are, they're looked at as independent away from, uh, f away from British Columbia. And everything we do in British Columbia is reinvested back into British Columbia. So now... By the way, if you start to fall into cash uh, shortfall, your we're hoping our cash investments reserve in the United States that's what we're hoping. is what's going to support here. Absolutely. Wow. Yep. And you'll see more and more of that happening even with the big majors, right? They're starting to expand, as you mentioned earlier, both into Alberta and into the United States. Quebec. Quebec. Atlanta or yep. Georgia, Louisiana, and so on. Yep. Yes. Maryland, Virginia, and yep. all of these states are extremely welcoming to companies like ours that want to come and make those types of investments. And it's changing lives down there. I'm not, I'm, I might yeah. sound dramatic, but no, we are well, changing lives. No, I know in lives. Louisiana, you're, it's a green field, uh, so you're starting ground up, but that's not what you're doing with that money here. No. Yeah. No. So it's a, it's a very interesting time for the company. Uh, the resiliency of our employees, the resiliency of Tom and Dick Jones and their family mm -hmm. um, is something of legend, to be honest with you. And you, you touched on it a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to just, uh, in our last couple of seconds, I want to give you a little tip of the hat here too for your uh, commitment to helping to rebuild Lytton. Thank Congratulations. You. Yeah, it, it was devastating. We'd lived through a similar type of situation at one of our mills before and the community came together for us. Yep. Uh, that was a number of years ago and it was never forgotten by, by Dick and Tom. So um, it was Tom who made the phone call that night and we had a commitment uh, within, the, within 24 or 36 hours to, uh, to put forward a, a bunch of the lumber that's going to be mm -hmm. required. My hope is that the environment will change and uh, you'll have a better uh, welcoming uh, reception here in British Columbia and continue to operate and grow here. Thanks us for, us yeah. too. We, yeah. we honestly just want to have the ability to, to speak honestly and openly uh, and be a part of the process because we do have some of the best forest practices in the world. We really do. Great. Thanks for coming in and sharing this with me. Thank you, Stuart.